Can you hear me? Yeah. What's it sound like? Sounds good. Can you see anything? Where's the mic? All right, we good? Yeah. Good. What are we going to say if I get busted with the camera? We're going to say that you're a foreign exchange student. <laughs> no, <laughs> we'll say that we're making a video for my father's birthday and we wanted to surprise him. Nina, where did I go? Okay, here goes Red. No, 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 she can't do that. I can go out, don't you? I'd say take a position. Yellow is dead on yellow. Red is not dead on yellow, so I can't come. Hey, Dad, how you doing? You may not film this. Would you feel uncomfortable? Yes, you may not do it. Just go play golf. Go on. Play golf? Just go play golf. You cannot film this. I'm serious. somebody here? Yes, this is my son, Jamie. Um, Hello, good to see you. Jamie Johnson, that's my dad. Am I a violation of the dress code? As long as it's white, you're fine. Well, this is so exciting. You know, I've, I don't think I've ever seen people playing croquet in all white before. Well, what do you mean? That is the uniform. <laughs> this is for the club paper? Yes. Great. You look like a gangster. Take your glasses off. Can you get closer? Well, I'm going to do my best. Wonderful shot. Are there teams? Yes, don't you play? I wish I did. Well, you should get your father to teach you. He's good. He's hiding that from you. He's hiding a lot of things from me, apparently. <laughs> It's an interesting game, yeah. because you can use other people's balls. What a chilly now. Kill, kill. Are you in college? I graduated from New York University, and I've been working on uh, documentary films. How? Really? Yes. What kind of a documentary are you doing? Actually, it's about uh, wealth and issues of social class and things like that in America. Uh. <clears throat> you cannot film this. I'm serious. All right, I think you're being unreasonable. I think it could be interesting. Go home. This is really what makes a family great. The center of a family, what I see is a white, beautiful sphere of pulsing energy inside of which all of you sit. And you're all atoms growing energetically, helped by each other. And that I know I'm a lucky guy. Puts out energy, doesn't it? My great-grandfather started the Johnson & Johnson Pharmaceutical Company, and my father inherited a fortune worth a billion dollars. Frankly, delight. People of this character are in that first circle. Every year, my family meets with an advisor to discuss our finances. And he usually says the same thing. We keep getting richer. In fact, our family's fortune is growing faster than ever. We're part of a small number of American families that own most of the country's wealth. Having so much in the hands of so few can't be good for America. It's a problem I've asked my father about before, but he has no patience for it. I can't, I can't tell you, I can't tell you how, uh, uh, you know, the, how to solve these problems. Don't reach for that shit. I gotta go. I gotta go. We're not done. We're done. Dad. Just wait. I have more questions. Just... I know. I'm not an expert on these issues. What do you want from me? It's obvious that my dad doesn't want to talk to me. And I think I know why. When he was my age, my father made a movie about poverty in Africa. 
I know his family severely reprimanded him for making his film, and that's probably why he's so reluctant to participate in mine. For them, shining a light on the extreme gap between rich and poor hit too close to home. The wealth gap is hard for rich people to acknowledge anywhere in the world, especially when it's in their own backyard. Today in America, the disparity between the haves and have-nots is worse than it's ever been. Now the top 1% of Americans, like my family and me, own roughly 40% of the country's wealth and we share an aggregate net worth that is greater than the net worth of the bottom 90% of individuals combined. Even though the last 28 years have brought America the largest economic boom in the history of finance, most of the rewards have gone to those who were already at the top of the ladder, and they still do. Average members of the 1% now earn over a million dollars a year, while a majority of Americans earn close to 35,000, which is what the average CEO earns for less than one day of work. No one has watched the rich get richer more closely than my family's financial advisor, who manages the fortunes of some of the richest families in the country. Jimmy, I... I'm not against you making the movie. The movie is fine for you to make. It's good for you to have something to do with your life, and it's a good project, but you don't know what the hell you're talking about. You have no idea the scope of, uh, and the impact of what you're saying is. And before you know it, it has had unintended consequences which you can't even imagine. And it becomes bigger than you ever thought, and it's taken forever to get to where we are. You don't need to go blowing up the apple cart, you know? It just, it's crazy, you're just, I hate to see you doing this to yourself. What about the facts and figures, though? I mean, oh, what, about the, the, what about the data? You're making a fool's argument, and it, it just, it depresses me to see you doing it. And you should just do a little bit more work on it. I don't think Brian does really want me to do more work. When I asked him for the names of other clients I could talk to, he refused to give them to me. So without his support, I'm using my family name to enroll in one of the most exclusive wealth conferences in America, where the wealthy go to discuss strategies for keeping their fortunes growing. The average net worth of the families that attend our conference is confidential, but it's a pretty large number. Uh, there are multi-billion dollar families represented, a number of them as a matter of fact, according to Forbes magazine. We don't ask for financial statements, of course, when people register, but we do query them to make sure that they are a sophisticated, qualified family in order to attend. I would say the average in the group today, probably around three to four hundred million, uh, certainly some smaller than that, and obviously a number of them much, much larger. I mean, there are people who are looking for funding for their projects that would kill to get into this meeting. That's right, absolutely, and we make sure they don't get to get in. <laughs> My goal as I get older for the families I serve, the few that I'm still consulting to, is to see if I can help them get to their fifth generations in good shape and go on from there. Family Wealth, the book you have in front of you, is about the first three generations. From the dozens of families that would turn up at this conference in, in the early 1990s, there are hundreds of families here today. And if you looked into the numbers that represent private wealth in a large enough aggregation that you'd have a family office, I'm sure it has to be in the many trillions of dollars. There is much greater good done by the people with the wealth in creating jobs, creating business opportunities, and in philanthropy uh, than otherwise. And I would say that it, it makes more sense to me to encourage business ownership, encourage wealthy to, uh, to generate that wealth so that wealth can then be shared rather than uh, take it from individuals to then redistribute it through uh, social policy and transfer policies of uh, Medicare, Social Security, et cetera. I hope that didn't come out sounding crass, by the way. You know, you know what I mean? It's like, I don't want to sound, okay. You know what I'm talking about? It's like, don't take the money from me.
In the early 80s, the American economy was rebuilt around the interests of big business and wealthy individuals with the idea that their success would eventually benefit everybody. This trickle-down policy was the brainchild of the economist Milton Friedman, who got a Nobel Prize for it in 1976. And now, his ideas are more popular than ever. Please be seated. Thank you all very much. It's uh, an honor for me to be here to uh, pay tribute to a hero of freedom, Milton Friedman. He has used a brilliant mind to advance a moral vision. I've studied, you know, the basics of your theories, and I've read about you in high school economics textbooks. Now tell me something. You say you've read some of my work. Have you, in fact, read Capitalism and Freedom? Well, in school, you're assigned readings, you know what I mean? And then they Xerox it. OK. Let me go back again. I'm, I'm just trying to see what, how much of a faker you are. OK. Since the 70s, the gap between the rich and poor has been growing. But what's happened to the level of income of the poor? It's risen, but in comparison to the top of course. percent, very, very minimal. But would it be better if it hadn't risen at all? Would it be better if you had kept the difference the same? But no growth in the bottom? Well, if we curtailed growth at the top. You'll kill the growth at the bottom. Look, the engine that leads to the miracles that we've seen, that enables you to have a television camera like that, that engine is, is uh, ambition and drive to become wealthy. People say, well, isn't it uh, selfish that you want to get ahead? No, in a sense, if you have a certain talent, in a free society, you should have the opportunity to discover what that talent is. Everyone has a knack for something. And develop that talent. And by developing your talent, by trying to meet your goals and ambitions, you're not only helping yourself, you're helping others. You might say I came to the attention of top management at a fairly young age. As uh, my father said, there is nothing wrong with nepotism as long as you keep it within the family. And this is a chateau in uh, Malawa, France, where uh, we do some of our uh, entertaining for Forbes International. And the Highlander is used two or three nights a week uh, uh, by uh, marketing and advertising. Sometimes you have to spend money to make money. Capitalism is, I think, uh, a moral system. And uh, this idea in our popular culture, you see it in every novel, the businessman's the heavy in Hollywood, the businessman and the corporation are always the font of evil. But in the real world, even if you have an unpleasant personality, even if you're the kind of person that make babies cry, and you're just out for yourself, you're not gonna make, make it unless you're doing something for other people. And uh, given all the flaws of human nature, the system has, 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 has worked. Everybody has a sinful view of making money. Our stores that made the most money had the happiest customers and best co-workers. They were always the most motivated. And there's a relationship between profits and those things. It's not, it's not a sin to make money. The first store was this lunchroom. Imagine a line straight back. And they see that extra part back there? That wasn't there. This window wasn't here. It's from here back to that wall and over. It was about 100 square feet, you with me? Here to here, here to here, to here. And then have a sliding window here. You couldn't let the customers in, right? Because there wasn't enough room, so everybody had to wait outside. The Xerox machine was there, and I sold these notebooks. First day in business, some guy who was for Kurdistan, cool country, I love it. Before I opened up, in the middle of the night, like at 9 o'clock, he gave me a $50 job. So I've loved the Kurdish people ever since. It was called Kinko's because of my nickname, because they had this kinky hair. And if you think of it, the first thing a baby learns is goo goo, gaga. -ga. And you think of good businesses like Kodak, Xerox, Google. People remember strong constants. That's why Kinko's was a good name. But really, I had this big curly, curly hair. And before being called Kinko, I was pube head. So I thought uh, Kinko's was better than pubos. Do you want to make hundreds of millions of dollars on top of what you already have? Yeah. Yes, hell yes. Yeah, I want to make a hell of a lot more. Can you tell me about that? Well, one day I'd like to go to the moon and look at the planet Earth and say, ah, that's part of my portfolio. It sounds ridiculous, but Paul and a few people like him really do own the world's portfolio. 
And when you start to look around, the disparity is hard to miss. You know, you hear them get up there all the time, uh, land of opportunity, you know, all this shit. That's in their head. They must don't ride through the same neighborhoods I ride through. They must don't go through the same towns I go to. They must don't visit and see the same people I visit on a daily basis. And they can't do that riding around in a damn limo in a helicopter. Wealth inequality is probably at an all-time high in the United States. We have reached levels of inequality that uh, you, you've seen only in the oligarchies of South America. Starting here with the tale of two cities, what you have is a level of concentration of wealth uh, probably never seen before in our history. Now, of course, you have tens of millions of workers who can't live on what they earn, and they're earning less in inflation-adjusted dollars than even 1973. Countries like Peru or Venezuela, Colombia, even Brazil, there have been uh, armed rebellions going on for decades now. And given the sense of frustration uh, among the working class in this country, I, I would not rule out the possibility of this kind of armed rebellion in this country. It's hard to say why that particular bullet was shot, but you know, it's a neighborhood where a lot of things are changing, where a lot of people are upset, where people have been pushed out of their homes by real estate value, not being able to pay the taxes, whatever else. You know, I've tried to think about it. I've tried to think about if I were out there and someone else were in here, what would cause me to be resentful or envious. The south side of Chicago is one of the poorest inner city communities in America. But now rich people are moving in and creating some serious changes in the neighborhood. Mr. Pants? Hey, Mr. Pants. Come on in, Mr. Pants. Pants. Mr. Pants is my second kitten. I had a kitten growing up, and when I went to get King, my first Mr. Pants, my father told me, you don't have to buy the first kitten you see. Well, I walked in, he kind of came over and purred, and I was like, oh, I want that one, you know. First kitten I saw, I bought it. Well, buying a condo was kind of similar. I walked into this room and I said, wow, you know, I've been in a lot of the coolest houses in Chicago. I've never seen a room like this. Let's get this condo. So I got with my dad and we talked about it. And I said, wow, I got to like run to an ATM and get the deposit and whatever. I was just freaked out about it. Um, 30 days later, I owned the place and I uh, haven't regretted the transaction since. It's a very thought-provoking place. You see the train go by and you're reminded that there are other places in the country other than Chicago. And you see what used to be housing projects and are suddenly condos and you wonder what impact you're having on the city and who lives here, who can afford to live here. It wouldn't be such a big deal if the change weren't so drastic. So these buildings used to be public housing. Now they're being taken condo. Sure, you put in new windows and you spruce the place up a little, but the fact is that someone who is using the public housing system lost his home for each one of these units that's being created. too quick. Um, the new stores and everything and the new houses is too quick. The subway right there, all of this is, I mean, it's too quick. It's too, it's too, um, too make-believe to be true because, um, like five years ago, you would have never dreamed that those nice, uh, condos would be there and then the subway would be there. Overall, I think gentrification is a tool that solidifies the stratification of classes. There are people who live in an area 
that becomes 100% people like them. Three big tools have been used in a lot of areas. First, you build a big police station. Secondly, you tear out all the basketball courts. And lastly, if there's a local public school that poor people attend, you tear down the school. They closed three schools up in our neighborhood. The middle school, the high school, and the uh, baby school. Why? They closed three buildings. I don't know. I don't know. I guess they're trying to push us out the neighborhood. It's, it's, it's uh, decent people living the project. You know, pay their rent, people work. You know, everybody ain't the, the enemy. Just like hey, what's happening? Have you lived here your whole life? Yeah, I lived here approximately my whole life, 28 years to be exact. So, this is the garbage they put up here that they pulled have been taken down because the problem they had is fixed. This is our lobby. The phones used to work when the police used to have a police station right here. This used to be their police station right there. What happened to that? We ran them away. Well, the people ran them away because they was on BS. That's our mailboxes. Half of the doors don't lock on the mailbox. Do, Do I have any mail? I ain't checked the mailbox today. Oh, I got a bill. Yep, I got a bill from the uh, Tribune that I'll never get the newspaper if they send it to me. The changes in the neighborhood is changes in the neighborhood around us, not to us, around us. We got one and a half schools in our neighborhood. 35, 40 kids in one classroom with one teacher. He can't teach everybody all, you know, he needs some help. So that's why all the kids when they go in class, if they ain't getting no attention, they gonna run away. This land is worth more than what the niggas over here can give them. So what can you do with them? Displace them, and the ones that you don't want over here, you get rid of them. You get rid of them. You know, and what you use as an excuse, use the drug dealers, use the cocaine house. You know what I'm saying, cocaine dealers. You know what I'm saying, you use the people that's over here doing nonsense, to try to get rid of nonsense. We grew up as a family, you know, one building to the next building to the next building. You know, you can sit up here and talk all you want to, but yet still, we love our kids. This is my son. Come here. This is my son. Do you feel like your kids have an opportunity to get rich in this country? Hell no. Hell no. They ain't no rappers. My kids ain't gonna be rappers. They ain't gonna be. They ain't gonna be rich. It's easier to just cleanse the earth of these people, send them to the far reaches of the universe, and the mayor's office will build a big police station, build a bunch of townhouses. The yuppies will buy in and bougify it, and suddenly. We'll have a community. Yeah, there'll be a m bunch of people displaced. Yeah, there'll be a bunch of crime problems. But it's easier. We found the easy solution. Charles Darwin uh, did not invent the term survival of the fittest. That was Herbert Spencer, uh, a social Darwinist, who thought that if we just allowed the rich to get richer, uh, well, uh, that was good for society because we want to discourage the poor from having a lot of children and, uh, and, and basically surviving. That kind of social Darwinist notion has stayed alive uh, in uh, certain quarters. And I believe that it is there behind much of the economic policies we are now seeing. Look, there's never in history been a time when the ordinary people of this world, and particularly in the rich nations, like the United States, Britain, and Europe. Never been a time when the ordinary people have had the level of income and live, living that they now do. But what about the tens of thousands of people whose lives were affected by the decision? You can't decision. make an omelet without breaking eggs. You have a system which is overwhelmingly yielding good results. But there's no question that every, there, it's not perfect. And there are cases and people will be get hurt. But that's true of any system. Doesn't it make you nervous when you see 
so many powerful and extremely wealthy individuals sitting there directly influencing those politicians when we're in a democracy? They're not influencing anything. They're, they're playing a role in the political system, but Congress is ultimately going to be influenced by public opinion, by what the public wants. The public will get what the public wants. A few months ago, I told the American people I did not trade arms for hostages. My heart and my best intentions still tell me that's true, but the facts and the evidence tell me it is not. In the 1980s, the U.S. government illegally sold weapons to Iran and used the money to support Nicaraguan rebels in what turned out to be the Iran-Contra scandal. At the center of the deal was one billionaire who had unfettered access to the secret workings of the U.S. government. We got involved in this Iran-Contra story, which unfortunately backfired a little bit on everybody. They asked me to finance it. I said, okay. So I gave credit to the CIA for a million dollars, and they shipped the equipment, and the Iranian paid me back. It was supposed to be a hush-hush operation. As business people, we have ways of manipulating the government officials, and they have ways of manipulating us. I take advantage of opportunities that come. In all relationship in the world, when you have contact, like if I have contact with you now, I'll call you when I arrive in New York and say, Hi, Adnan, I want to see you. I have to say, it's, it's, it's nothing abnormal. You probably will take me out to dinner and introduce me to another person who I make business with. You would say you're not an arms dealer and you never were? No. I mean, the truth is, if you investigate, through the records and so on, you find out we never dealt in arms. It was just a title given to us by the press. But when you helped connect the United States government and the Saudi government over sales of weapons, mm. what would you call that? Marketing. I worked with the British on the lightning program. I worked with Raytheon on the missiles. I worked with Northrop on the F-5. But this is normal business. This is the whole life around the free system is like that. It's been the case for the last 25 years in the United States that the amount of money flowing into the system uh, for political contributions has been a major shaper of who gets what within the economy because they always want something, whether it's a tax change or it's a change in regulation or it's a subsidy or what have you. And as a result, there are a number of studies that show the people giving the money have often had the greatest benefit in terms of what happened to their stock price or their own personal fortune. Meet the kings of sugar. Pepe and his brother Alfonso Juan Hool of Palm Beach, Florida. Critics estimate these plantation owners make an extra $65 million a year off the sugar program in American consumers. The government puts the total cost to consumers at at least $1.4 billion a year. The Von Hools, there is no story <coughs> of the Von Hools. If you're, if you're if you're doing got me up this morning to talk about the Von Hools, and we're making an issue of the Von Hools as such, <clears throat> we could get it over with in a hurry. In that fatal moment in the Oval Office, when Bill Clinton was confronting Monica and telling her it was over, he's interrupted with a call uh, from it turns out Alfie Von Hull. Alfie Von Hull was very concerned that Al Gore had made a speech the day before saying that he, sugar companies were going to have to pay for the cleanup of the Everglades. So while Monica sat there in her tears, Bill Clinton spent 22 minutes on the phone reassuring Alfie Fonhold that everything was okay, that they would be true to true and blue, and even that Al Gore guy, he's just saying that to get elected, keep giving us money so Al can be president. <laughs> The 
nobody knows exactly what it costs to produce a pound of sugar in the Everglades, but it's the second most profitable crop to tobacco in the United States, and it has made the Von Hull family extraordinarily rich. The incredible thing is that for every pound of sugar grown in the Everglades, and we're talking about hundreds of millions of tons, the American taxpayer guarantees a price of 22 cents a pound, way above the world price of seven cents a pound. The sugar program is a combination of import quotas and a guarantee that the government will buy any surplus. It limits dramatically, it limits to almost nothing, the amount of foreign sugar that's permitted to enter the U.S. That means if you need sugar in the U.S., you have to buy it from the U.S. sugar producers. And that, that results in the price being artificially raised. There's a shortage, usually, and so the U.S. price of sugar is higher than the world price. So you can go to Canada and the price of sugar is one-third of the United States or Mexico is one-third of the price in the United States and they guarantee the price so there is too much sugar in the United States the federal government will buy the sugar at the high price. It makes zero economic sense. Here the country is running a 500 billion dollar a year deficit and we're subsidizing sugar production in the Everglades which is damaging the same system that we're spending hundreds of millions of dollars to repair. If you really think about it, it's nonsensical, it's even comical. If it wasn't so hideous, it really would be laughable. The Von Hul family makes hundreds of millions of dollars, become very wealthy because of a government program. And there's no reason why the federal government should create a program to make the Fon Hools richer. We're in effect subsidizing the Fon Hools and hurting the American public buying products that have sugar in it. One was the Republican, one was the Democrat. Alfie Fon Hull was the single largest contributor in Florida to the Clinton campaign, and his brother was the largest contributor to the Republican Bob Dole campaign. They had it covered either way. What we're talking about is somewhere over $400,000. To various people and contributions to the Republican National Committee. They are putting down, in most of these cases, their occupation is with the Florida Crystals Corporation. That's the Sugar Corporation. Yeah. Well, that's them. Money doesn't decide every issue in politics, but most issues it plays a major part in. And if you're going to try to understand politics and why things happen the way they do in Washington, you have to, as they say, follow the money. That's an industry. How democratic is that? It ain't. It is called free enterprise. <laughs> His free enterprise. While Alfie and Pepe Van Hool get richer off government programs, the towns where they base their businesses sink deeper into poverty. Well, this city of Belgrade is a labor community because we have a lot of agriculture in the area. Uh, Sugarcane being the largest, and it has a vast majority of uh, eth you know ethnic backgrounds or ethnic. What's that word I'm looking for? Ethnicity. When sugar barons like the Fon Hools needed cheap labor, the U.S. made an exemption to immigration laws. Foreign workers were imported on a special visa to cut sugarcane for third world wages. It really disappointed me. I'm saying, but you gotta see the system, you can't beat it. Everybody from Jamaica come here, they come here to achieve something to support their family. Hard work, hard, real hard work. You know. Sometimes our supervisors tell us, the boys, it will be blood, sweat, and tears. And it was. I, I used to see people, man, go out cutting caves when I come to visit my cousin. They come back, lacerations, the, the canines, they cut them in the hand, chop them in the leg. I see men cut off in tomb, clean as a man bust in me. I see a lot of things going on yeah. in the field. The figures show that every year there was an average of 10 workers killed in sugarcane work. 
when the government came down as part of their review of the Sugar Act to see that the workers were being paid properly. It found massive minimum wage violations throughout the sugar industry. This, we believe, cost the workers probably, certainly millions of dollars a year, maybe as much as $10 million a year. It's a lot of time we know that we were short pay our, you know, are doing some work for um, a lot of, uh, a lot of lesser money more than what we supposed to work for, you know. But ain't nothing much we can do about it. Yeah. Got to go out there and work all day long. How much you made today? $35, $40. You got to work your behind off to make 50 bucks. Although the Fon Hools deny wrongfully cutting wages and putting their workers' safety at risk, eventually mounting lawsuits and increasing scrutiny caused them to mechanize their sugar harvest. Many of the migrants who had come to work in their fields stayed in America, hoping for other opportunities, but they haven't made it very far. Do you think it makes it difficult for the people living in that community to change their lives when they're raised in that community because they live in those conditions? No. I mean, there's a lot of talent down there. A lot of talent. Um, you know, this community here has produced several famous football players. Okay. Fred Taylor for the Jacksonville Jaguars. So that's the way they... Came. I mean, that's just one of the ways. Uh, Jesse Hester used to play for the Colts. And the Raiders. The family lives right back here. I mean, that's just one of the things. I mean, and then there's other athletes, and, and there are a lot of talented people in this community. It's hard to believe that just a few miles down the road from Bell Glade is one of the richest towns in America, Palm Beach. The contrast between the two communities is astounding. But most rich people have come to accept the blatant inequality as a way of life in our country. I know my father is different. He struggles with it. Yet every time I turn the camera on, his instinct is to keep quiet. If we're in the middle of the meeting, you come in with the camera, we don't want to talk on camera about what we're doing. Well, I just think, you know, if we're secretive... Secretive about what? about wealth, about the American aristocracy. Well, sure. It's written up in every paper twice a year. They tell, tell you with a yeah. nickel how much you're What's the about secret? Why can't I be secretive? Every man's house is his castle in this country. There's nothing wrong with shedding light on that and revealing it, and then hopefully it corrects it, sir. Well, I want you to be careful. And I mean that. It's, the, you know, your personal family. Well, you made your movie, and now you don't want to talk? Jamie, what is so dark here? What do you think is going on? What are, you, what are you talking about? Take this camera and your film and do another person or another family. It's not going to happen here. It's frustrating because I know when my dad was my age, he had something to say about social inequality. And I think the subject is so complicated for him that now he chooses to avoid it at all costs. But for some rich people I talk to, inequality is easy to understand. It's preordained. If you inherit money, then you feel, why did I get all this and somebody else is poor? Well, God had a reason for that. God's never going to give you anything that you can't handle. People mistake the Bible as something that you put on the shelf after Sunday, but it is, it is a guideline that you run your business by, you run your family by, and you run your life by, and you will succeed. We have about $260 million in sales, and we have 1,150 employees. We're in the top 30 private landowners in the United States, and we're the largest private landowner in Louisiana. See the TV set? Yeah. They're all around the plant, and that shows each worker how they're doing real time. It's like the proverb, don't muzzle an ox while it's treading. <laughs> and what that means is keep, the, keep uh, everybody happy and they will do a lot better job. We have a plasma TV in the, um, in the lunchroom so that we can communicate better with the employees. You might have seen some scripture up there. 
Is that from the Bible? Yeah, Marketplace Ministries is a, is a company chaplain service that we offer free to our employees. They get breaks during the day and they can come in the lunchroom, have Cokes and sandwiches and so forth and get their inf in, informations, <laughs> inf infomercials, I should say, up there. They see what's happening. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich man to get into heaven. Back then, uh, rich people uh, in, in the Jewish uh, states were the, uh, the most uh, pious. They were the ones they thought that, the, that uh, God favored the most because they were wealthy. Just because you're wealthy doesn't mean you're, you're not going to get into heaven. It means that God has given you a lot of assets to be stewards of. And he's going to sit back and watch how you do it. I think uh, empathy is a very, very important quality. You can't even motivate people to have a business if you're not empathetic to your hey, customers and workers. Hi. <laughs> How you doing? Crazy, crippled. Well. Out of my mind, eating my bread, and, you know, taking a little nap, you know. Yeah. I got this T-shirt. It's kind of crazy. What's well, a good black and white's a good combination nowadays. Oh. Go. Fifty cent. Fifty cent. That's good. Hey, you got a dollar? Okay, that would really help me out. Man. I can go to the store and fix myself up. Okay. Hey, thanks for coming by. Hey, cool. Hey. And what is your name? Paul. Hey, Paul. What's nice up, to Paul? see you, buddy. Take care. They don't usually give homeless folks money. Unless a homeless person is playing music or trying to better themselves, selling pencils or doing something, I generally... Um, don't do much. In this case, I thought the most genteel way to also have him leave was possibly give him a dollar. You know, you don't want to look like Mother Teresa. I mean, how do you take it to an extreme? How much do you, I mean, if you want to really be the minimalist, you look like Mother Teresa, are you, it's always an ambiguous thing. You should have a little bit of guilt and a little bit of pride. I don't know how to answer it. I'm the great-grandson of the meatpacker Oscar Mayer. <laughs> And when I was 16, my father told me that I was going to inherit enough money, so much money, that I wouldn't have to work. But I made a decision to give up that wealth. I grew up in a wealthy suburban community. And I went to school with kids who came to school in chauffeur-driven cars, Kathy Iacocca. His dad was Lee Iacocca, Alfred Taubman's son, you know own Sotheby's auction house. You know, the, these were the kids I went to school with. So we lived, we, I grew up in a, uh, in a wealth bubble. But I remember thinking at that time, huh, there's something, something wrong here. Something about unfairness. That's about as much as I remember that, that, that little seed was probably planted then. Um, and then I wrote my dad a letter, basically telling him that my desire, intention to give away the money that I had he called me after he got the letter. He said, uh, I'm coming to Boston. I want to talk to you about this. And he came out and, uh, and he said, uh, you know, um, you've been away from home for about 10 years now. Uh, I don't quite understand this decision. Maybe you should sort of tell me what's happened since you left home. And so he, he listened to me for a while, just talk about that. And then he kind of, at the very end, he says, OK, I understand. I understand what this is about. You know, I don't, I don't think it's a good idea. Uh, and my questions have to do with, have you really thought through all the consequences of this? Like, what if you have a child one day and that child has a severe disability? And he really pushed me on all these what if questions, all the sort of worst case scenarios. For me, it always came back to, well, I would be in the same boat as 98% of the people I know. Now, I do meet people today who say, it's hard to get by on 50 million, you know? I need more. I think those people are sick, you know, to, to, to need that much to have a good life. I mean, I think you gotta take a look at yourself there, buddy. <laughs> you know, if you, if you feel like you don't have enough at that point. I'm in Los Angeles and uh, I'm staying at the Beverly Wilshire. People ask me why I stay at the Beverly Wilshire rather than other more trendy hotels. And uh, my answer, I think it's an important point, this of distinction, is that 
I'm really not interested in being cool, uh, I'm interested in being served. I'm from Italy, and in Italy I possess money, but also notoriety. Uh, notoriety for what? For having been rich for, say, five centuries. But when I moved to New York, all I was was a young kid with money, and I really felt that there was something missing. At home, I was, you know, the Baron. Here in America, you're nobody. Are you a model, or do you act, or... I'm, I'm just asking. Uh, no, I don't do anything. Actually, that's the point of the... The, the, the whole the, documentary. The, the, uh, I'm just like a, like a rich dude in, in Rodeo yeah. Drive, and, and, uh, <laughs> and the fact that I don't do shit, you know, that's... <laughs> <laughs> Here, there's no monarchy that can knight you and say you're a baron now, but there is the media. And so what I did was I hired a publicist um, and started doing uh, events and red carpets. All of a sudden you are a baron in a different way, but in a contemporary way. Today I'm in Los Angeles for some meetings with some production companies and networks for uh, possibly a reality show, uh, which would be featuring me. America is fascinated by seeing the trappings of wealth, and more specifically, rank. Americans rejected inequality at the inception. They said no to aristocracy, they said no to all of this. But at the same time, when you shed your sins, you, you retain a, a secret desire of having them back. In America, some of the richest citizens are treated like aristocracy, even when they go to great lengths to control how the public perceives them. When I contacted Warren Buffett about this film, he refused to talk. But a friend introduced me to his granddaughter, and she invited me to her home to show me what life is like in the second richest family in the world. I think when we can really let go of excessive stuff and the need to, you know, kind of have excessive stuff is, is a real, um, there's a lot of dignity in that. I've been very blessed to have my education taken care of and I have my living expenses taken care of while I'm in school. After we're out of school, we don't get any money from our family. I work for um, a family here in San Francisco. I do a lot of organizing of just things in their home, organizing of toys. Um, I'm actually pretty good at looking at a very messy closet or space and making order out of chaos. So that's something I'll do before the kids come home. And then usually when the kids get home, I'm responsible for um, very general things like bath time and dinner time and homework time. I think it's a very weird thing to be working for a very wealthy family considering I do come from one of the wealthiest families in America. And I feel that the family I work for feels a bit of humor around the fact that I am from one of the wealthiest families. A wealthier family than I believe they are. I don't want to make any assumptions, but I think that might be the case. Um, and I think we all kind of find it odd and also just wild and a little bit funny um, that that's the case. Since I was like 18, I've been totally focused on making art, being an artist. I transform a lot of my questions, doubts, and, and fears um, through art. I feel very fulfilled. I feel really happy in my life. I feel like I have more than what I need and definitely what I need. 
How do you feel like your grandfather would react if he saw you in this video? Um, I definitely fear judgment. Um, money is the spoke in my grandfather's wheel of life. I think either people are coming from a place of love or fear, and fear drives us to want to hold on to things and not share because we're afraid that there's not enough for ourselves, and if we let go, you know, we're gonna not have enough for ourselves. Fear is what stops most wealthy people from talking about their money. In many cases, children in wealthy families are nervous that they're going to get punished for what they say. I don't think Nicole or I expected how severely her grandfather would react to her presence in this film. I'm gonna... But after the shoot in her studio, she received a letter from him that surprised us all. So, did you read that first opening line? No, you want to? I read, Dear Grandpa, I guess in the letter, he states that their relationship is over and that she is no longer a member of their family. Most of my family adopted you as a niece or a cousin because I was in this film. You know, it has made Grandpa, you know, upset. Upset to the extent that now he's going to say I'm not his real granddaughter. In this picture of Grandpa and us as little girls here, I've spent months and years of my life at his home in Omaha, which was my twin sister and I, in spring break, we would go and visit him, and we would stay in his home, and it was just us, and we spent so much time bonding as his grandchildren. Money is a part of life. You have to make money to live, and so, but I think that when that element of necessity is taken to an extreme, there's an imbalance there, and with that, with that monetary imbalance comes an emotional imbalance. At the same time of Nicole's struggle with her grandfather, Warren Buffett came out and announced that he was giving a majority of his fortune to charity. I asked Nicole how she felt as the world celebrated his generosity. I feel that who my grandfather is publicly, as a public figure, and who my grandfather Warren Buffett is as a grandfather, as a father, as a brother, as a son, are two completely different things. Warren Buffett's reaction to the film ended up in the newspaper. My family started to get nervous, and they called me in for a meeting with my father and his financial advisor. Jamie, I don't agree with the thesis of your movie. I don't uh, respect the way in which you documented it. I don't know that you're right. I mean, I think this movie's taking it in a good direction. I think so far I've learned a lot. And I think, if anything, what I've seen suggests that some of my original thoughts about it were on the right track. And I don't understand why your resistance would be so severe. I mean, if it's not a threatening thing, then why are you reacting this way? Now, Jamie, I'm not freaked out by the project. I'm disappointed in what you've uh, conspired to do with it. Jim, what you just you think Brian's right? What do you mean, Brian? He's upset. I can understand it. I'm not sure whether he's right or wrong, but I feel like this movie is a good idea and I feel like I'm got to go forward with it either way. I can't take any more. It's too much for me. Well, Brian, Jamie, I don't understand I, why. I, I, human, I get pissed off when you say, okay, fine, I'll, do, I'll go do my homework, and you don't. I don't need it. It's a pain in the ass. You're behaving like a little arrogant Trustafarian. You know, come on, give me a break. I'm not surprised that Brian is upset with this movie. 
His job is to ensure that members of the 1% keep getting richer. And for him, the growing wealth gap is an indication that he and people like him are doing their jobs. But not all rich people see the growing wealth gap as a good sign. For some, it's a problem that needs to be reversed. People who have been enabled to accumulate very, very large wealth have an indebtedness to society for having made that possible. They live in a place which generates individual wealth. The creation of the microprocessor, the human genome, uh, research, uh, the internet, none of those things would exist but for the $90 billion that the federal government spends every year on basic research. People don't really see the role that the use of tax dollars plays in making our economy so um, vibrant. Hold on. What if we had a slightly more aggressive tax system and supported the, the bottom the bottom you would have less you would have less growth and the bottom would be poorer would in the end end up worse off you would do harm not good look people don't pay those high taxes they find ways of getting around it and you're never going to be able to stop them from finding ways to get around it i mean i think there's some there's definitely merit to that and i certainly wouldn't advocate socialism I well you are advocating excuse me don't talk that way. You are advocating socialism. That's exactly what you're advocating. You're just not willing to call it socialism. I'm just advocating a slightly more progressive tax structure. That's socialism. If you're going to have a society of balance, uh, the load of the taxes have to fall on the people with the money. And I don't resent the very wealthy. As a matter of fact, I'd like to be one. But I do think that many of the wealthy people understand that they could probably pass a little bit of another tax break to have a little left for a head start. Back in the old days, you would tax passive income, meaning dividend and interest income, differently than salaried income. Right now, a guy making money from dividends pays 15% tax, but a soldier over in Iraq pays 40% uh, tax, 30% income tax. Imagine the idea of, of, of a worker going to a foundry every day, heat, dust, working. Imagine a society that says to that foundry worker, you're going to pay more share of your income in federal income taxes than the multi-millionaire is going to pay on his or her dividends and capital gains. Entrepreneurs and small business owners are also singled out for punishment by the estate tax better known as the death tax. When you die, uh, if, you're, if your um, assets flow to your descendants, then the descendants that receive it are required to uh, pay a tax on that transfer. The uh, estate tax in itself is, a, is really, to me, anti-American. It is a redistributionist type tax because that money has been taxed and taxed and taxed all throughout your life and then they tax it again. Taxes on estates are our uh, board are criminal but, uh, and are uh, unethical, in fact. The estate tax in about five years will only apply uh, the federal estate tax to about three, 4,000 estates, the real rich estates, ten, you know, 10 million and above. Maybe it's even less than that. Uh, but the propaganda by the Republicans and the rich have been so relentless uh, that most people think, gee, you know, my estate should go to my kids. Not, the federal government shouldn't tax it. You don't pay the estate tax unless you are already extremely wealthy. Uh, it's mythological that this is for small farmers or for small businesses. No, we're talking about the wealthiest people in this country. I remember in 1997, there was this big push to abolish the inheritance tax. And at the time, I was like, wow, where did this come from? Now I know that the Mars family and the Gallo family and all these enormously wealthy families um, bankrolled an effort to abolish the inheritance tax. Forrest Mars, net worth $10 billion, you know, lives in Virginia and wants to get rid of the estate tax. I mean, how much money does he want to pass on, you know? <laughs> it was um, December 2000 that I got an email from Bill Gates Sr., the father of the founder of Microsoft, who said, how can I help? You know, I'm, I, he, he said, I'm, the idea that we would 
eliminate the estate tax is just wrong. He says, well, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll call Warren Buffett and George Soros and Paul Newman. And so I said, all right, you, you call your friends and I'll call my friends and we'll, we'll see what we can do. Uh, I'm here talking to people in the Senate about the uh, federal estate tax bill. The Republicans are trying to repeal it. Their constituents don't like to pay the tax, and they're trying to help their constituents by repealing it. How's everything in Seattle? We are developing a very serious wealth disparity. And the fact of the matter is that the, the disparity has developed, even though we do have an estate tax. So I, I hate to think how, uh, how bad it would be if we, we hadn't had an estate tax over this time. If we continue to reduce the estate tax on the schedule we now have, it means that we are going to have the children of the wealthiest people in this country uh, owning more and more of the assets of this country, and their children as well. We're going to have family dynasties of a sort that we had in the late 19th century. Meanwhile, the rest of the country is going to have to be, be paying more and more in taxes uh, to keep uh, us safe from terrorism, uh, to make sure we have roads and bridges and and education and the minimum amount of health care we do, Medicare um, and, and Medicaid, uh, it's unfair. It's unjust. Uh, it's absurd. In late August of 2005, Hurricane Katrina hit the Gulf Coast of the United States. I want every American to know that their government is doing everything it can to help get relief to those in need as quickly as possible. They told us if you want to be rescued, go to the Superdome. All of a sudden, now they're telling us, go to the bridge. Oh, we have very few resources. What are we supposed to do? It is wrong. We have no water. You could have dropped it from the sky from them helicopters. How's a three-week-old infant going to be able to survive out here with no milk, no water? Look how hot he is. He's not waking up very easy. We have regular insulin. There were, like, bodies floating past my front door, you know? Bodies floating past my front door. Americans are generous to each other, and I just hope that what the world is seeing is that even though we've been hit with something that is unlike anything that we've been hit with before, the generosity of this country and the caring of Americans for Americans is, I think, what is coming through. For five days, tens of thousands of people waited for help from a government that had seemingly forgotten them. When the president finally did show up, he didn't seem too worried about those most in need. Out of the rubbles of Trent Lott's house, his high lost his entire house, there's gonna be a fantastic house, and I'm looking forward to sitting on the porch. <laughs> While the president enthusiastically planned his future visits to Trent Lott's beach house, Thousands of people waited outside the Superdome for food and water. Within a few days of the disaster, people already living on the edge of poverty were pushed to increasingly desperate measures to survive. Hey, drop. Hey, drop. It was the poor the people that didn't have an opportunity to buy a ticket or didn't have an automobile to get out of New Orleans. And even when we saw people calling out for help, help us, help us, save us, we were slow to respond. We are one people, we are one family, we are one house. And we all must have a place at the table in this house. And I think those in high places, whether it's the President of the United States, whether it's the Majority Leader of the Senate, 
for the Speaker of the House, for the Mayor of our cities, for business leaders, we must recognize the fact that none of us, not one of us, are going to get out of this predicament until we all sort of get out together, get tied together as a nation and as a people. The one thing you can depend on everybody is that he's going to put his interest above yours. I don't think that's a very hard thing to understand. Well, aren't all these signs that we're starting to see in America that are emerging in America? What signs? Sign, uh, didn't they all apply to past civilization? What's aren't it? we, don't we, we're not exempt from those if, rules if of we history, go, are we? If our, when our society collapses, it will be not be for the reasons you've cited. It will, be, it will be because our government has grown too big, because we have not held government down to size. I'm nervous that because we're not asking the right questions, because we're not willing to curtail our rapid growth, because I think the people it's time that for you to get out of here. We're at the stage now where the gap between the rich and poor is going to You've exhausted so my serious. patience. I have. <laughs> there is no equality in life. Forget about it. We are what we are. We are created layers over each other. This is it. There are the waiters that serve you coffee. There are the cooks. There are the, and there are the people who will buy the facilities and, and enjoy it. What can you do? That's life. I think that what we've seen in the last 20 years is reckless because of where the United States sort of is. At the, the, top part of its trajectory going down. We use too much oil, we make too much money out of finance, there's too much debt, there's a, a recklessness about resources, a recklessness about borrowing, a sense that it's always going to be up, up and away for the United States that serious study just doesn't support. America has been blessed because of its Judeo-Christian background, its alliance to the Ten Commandments and and its, its laws were based upon that. And that's why it's been blessed. If it gets away from that, it will fail. In the progressive era, in the first decades of the 20th century, we had a huge gap in income and wealth between people at the top and people at the bottom and the working class. Our cities were festering. Uh, the rich were capturing more and more power and wealth. But what did we do as a society? We didn't have a revolution. Uh, we didn't turn to socialism or communism or fascism. We reformed ourselves. The progressive era was an era of reform. We adopted a graduated progressive income tax. We regulated corporations. We busted up the big trusts, the big monopolies. Uh, we made jobs safer. Uh, we provided eventually, by the 1930s, unemployment insurance uh, and also uh, old age insurance called Social Security. Uh, we, in other words, did not embrace socialism. We embraced reform. The whole history of mankind is that, similar to geology, the center of the earth is all molten lava. And there's only a thin layer on earth you can live on, three, four miles. And there's so much down there that's all hot, hot, hot. And that thin layer is the difference between rich and poor. You need incentives in society so rich achieve things, but the whole history of mankind is that the lava overflows and kicks their ass. I think there are more and more really wealthy people, still small in number, who are basically saying, we cannot continue uh, this devastation of the uh, lives and hopes uh, and rights of tens of millions of our fellow Americans. That it's not smart from our point of view. They're multi-billionaires, but they're beginning to uh, be fearful of the future. My great-grandfather started the Johnson & Johnson Pharmaceutical Company. Okay, Johnson & Johnson. Big money. Yeah. Old money. Old crooked money. And that money that come out of their moonshiners and all. Look at it. There's some truth to that, man. I know it's true. It's the same way to get it in the forward. Man, see, the truth don't hurt. You know, I can tell you something, and you might think I'm an idiot. My family was one of the richest families in the world. 
but not with money. With love, kindness, tolerance, and patience. Qualities that's worth more than money, and you can't buy that. They taught me how to love people for who they are, not what I want them to be. See? They taught me how to get along with people. They taught me to treat people the way I want to be treated. They taught me to treat each person for who they are, not clump them together because we all different in our own way. That's the richness that I was brought up with. I know making this movie's been a little bit complicated for you. It has been complicated, Jamie. I wish that I'd shown more outward support from the very first, because you know, I am proud of you, and I hate to have to tell you this because I cry all the time, <laughs> but it's true. And um, I just wish I'd shown you right away how proud I was of you and how much I agreed with what you're trying to do. I wasn't born rich, so I might have started out with a very different set of ideas. And I've tried to be sensitive to your dad's ideas about it. And a little bit careful, you know? Somewhat considerate of him and how he likes it to be, and so uh, that creates a little conflict, and, and that creates a little conflict about the movie. What is so complicated about it? When I first married your dad, he was, after all, a surfer and a painter. And he uh, was not the grown person that you see today. And I, I think you and he could spend time exploring that. And now we've come to a conclusion, and I know you have some questions to ask me, and I'd like to proceed with them. Well, what about the movie you made when you were my age? Um, when I was uh, much younger, just out of college, I got in involved in charitable giving to an anti-apartheid organization that was making a film in South Africa. It involved wages and workers in certain companies. When it aired on public television, Johnson & Johnson, I know, was included in that. And several people connected with the company uh, started to complain to the CEO there about What's Jimmy Johnson doing? He's undermining our business. My name also appeared on the film credits, and I remember going down to meet with the CEO at the time, and I began to realize that it, it was a story with two sides, that the, uh, it, yes, they didn't pay that high, Forget it. <laughs> what? It's going nowhere. Just keep going. You got, well, I've I, got, you got, you got what I feel, and I can't give you solutions for the world. What do you mean? Well, if you have a way to help, you should do it. If you can affect one or two lives you've done a good work uh, I don't think you are necessarily set the goal of changing the world because it's it's maybe beyond what what's possible I'm proud of my father for making his movie it's surprising it took him so long to tell me about it, but the scolding he got from the company clearly took a toll on him, and it explains why he hates talking about money. 
Unfortunately, many rich people feel the same way as the executives who confronted my father. Self-preservation has given rise to the growing wealth gap in America. And the bigger the gap gets, the more removed wealthy people get from the world around them. But if you're always hiding from the problem, you're never going to find any solutions. <laughs>